so a few words just to present me, uh, first of all, myself. Uh, I'm Sébastien Treyer, I'm the executive director of IDRI, and IDRI stands in French for the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations. This is a think tank based in Paris, uh, the French think tank working on international environmental negotiations like the COP26 uh, of, of uh, climate, COP15 of biodiversity, and other uh, analogous uh, negotiations. <coughs> If you're interested to know what a think tank is, uh, please ask me questions afterwards. But basically what we do is to either produce papers that we put openly to the debate in order to uh, favor agreements that could be uh, uh, ambitious for the environmental transition in uh, international negotiations. We've done that ahead of uh, COP21, for instance. We published a paper with uh, research teams in the 16 mo most emitting countries in the world about the fact that in each of these countries there was a pathway to uh, social and economic prosperity that was compatible with the very uh, radical uh, decarbonization of the economy, even for India, even for South Africa, even for Brazil. Uh, that's the type of thing that we put in the open debate. Another type of intervention of a think tank is to, for instance, understand that there was ahead of COP21 and the Paris Agreement, a divergence between China and the rest of the world about transparency, about how we are going to look at, the, uh, to, to credibilize for the rest of the world that what China declares to do in terms of uh, reduction in emissions is actually credible. Uh, and China is very cautious not to be uh, controlled by the international community. There is a bad experience of having been of endurance, of, of uh, interference in, uh, in Chinese, and more than that, even, even of military interference with, uh, uh, within, politi uh, within uh, domestic policies in China. So we, we could understood that, but we tried to convene a closed door meeting with uh, negotiators from China, from Europe, from, from Africa, from the uh, uh, United States, and put on the table a paper showing that there was a technical legal solution to preserve the sovereignty of China and at the same time make it a little bit more credible that it's not just China declaring, but that there is some credibility behind that. So that's two interventions that we do and we work <clears throat> on a variety of uh, global uh, environmental governance issues. As I said, biodiversity, uh, climate, ocean, uh, and Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals in general. Please don't hesitate to ask me about that, if that's of interest to you. Please look also at our webpage to see if there are internships or things, uh, jobs, that, opportunities that are interesting for you, because we are always very open to have uh, international uh, um, um, colleagues joining us. <coughs> We are, a part, we are based at the Sciences Po University, which is the social science university, uh, 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 science politi political science university in Paris, which you, you might know, and that is associated to the uh, uh, Université de Paris. Today, what I want to present to you is a kind of a reflection about uh, the fact that um, climate and biodiversity have become geopolitical that actually uh, 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 an issue in the environment that seemed really anecdotical for the serious people talking about geopolitics that talk about the UN Security Council, about military conflict, politics, etc. Today this has entered center stage and that changes a lot the way we can discuss and, and find global agreements on, um, on, on environmental issues. So really, I'm going to discuss global environmental, global governance. This is really the, the talk of today. If you want to arrange it, to, to put it in a specific disciplinary silo, it would be in the field of uh, international relations in political sciences about global governance. But I really want also to, uh, more than giving you a lot of, uh, it's not a disciplinary talk that I intend to, to give. It's rather focusing on uh, what is it that we do when we try to, to, to make a better frameworks of governance, uh, of cooperation at international scale to uh, preserve global public goods. Um, and so my first point was to say uh, now, uh, for, for a long time, a lot of the people working on climate were, had, had the impression that there were a specific silo with the ministries of the environment 
and uh, you know the hippies in the room who care for the environment while the other people were discussing real life somewhere else. And that, this has completely changed. Um, but I, I really also want to tell you that to some extent, this at the same time is also, um, as, as I tried to do with that strange title, is also showing that geopolitical, um, the geopolitics of the world is also changing to some extent. And that the ecological transition is a good way to look also at how power is shifting in the world uh, currently. And not just power between established countries. Currently, you hear a lot the coming back of the notion that what matters is national powers, the, the rivalry between the US and China. This is true. But at the same time, you have very interesting people like Bertrand Badi from Sciences Po who are saying geopolitics is over. <laughs> That's his, I mean, his, his whole life he's been a professor of geopolitics, but now, he's, now that he's an elder uh, professor, he's saying, no, no, this is all over. Uh, what he's trying to, this provocative statement is just to say that actually state national states have only a piece of the power. They are very important. They can, they can, they can create wars, they can create uh, disruptions, and they, they can also solve, solve a lot of, of, of the problems. But at the same time, they are very weak compared to other issues that are uh, relating, uh, uh, that are putting us together, interconnecting us as, as, as societies in a, in a global world. So, uh, that might be a little bit small for you, so I, th this was my outline, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, what I try to, uh, the way I've prepared my presentation is to bring you through four main messages that are to some extent also aligned with different periods over time. The first thing that I want to do is have a look back. The two first points are, is, are having a look back at, let's say, the 80s during the Cold War and then uh, the, the period uh, between the 90s and, the year, and, and, to, and 2015. Um, the first message, and I'll come back to that, is really to say that um, even at time of very high geopolitical tensions, like the Cold War in Europe with the Iron Curtain div dividing Europe in two, environment was the issue on which you could have um, a cooperation and not just a marginal cooperation a cooperation that mattered a lot and i want to give you a, a, that as a, a reminder of the fact that uh, uh, the, the environment had been very important at the moments of the cold war for building up cooperation between foes between uh, uh, um, two two uh, fields two uh, powers that were really uh, opposing in the at the heart of europe um, the second and, and that I, I will use the examples of the acid rains problem uh, and the example of the ozone layer, uh, both uh, uh, discussed in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the 1980s. The second, uh, the second uh, issue that I want to discuss with you is uh, that we had, uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain and uh, the Rio Convention, the idea that suddenly uh, we, uh, you know that there was this statement that it was the end of history, uh, that we were g going to have a kind of a global governance that where we would uh, stop fighting. Uh, and in particular, there was the whole idea that we had common goods to protect climate, biodiversity. This was all the output of, uh, of Rio, Rio 92, the summit, uh, the Earth uh, summit in Rio, um, that produced the Convention on Climate, the Convention on, on Di Biological Diversity, that produced these COPs. COP26, COP15, um, and uh, with the idea that we would, to some extent, build a government of the world. There is no government of the world because it's just an issue of governance where the sovereign states are just sovereign over their own national boundaries, but there is no such a thing as a, as a global government. But we had the illusion of building something that would be nearly as if we had a government that could establish policies, public policies at the scale of the, of the whole world, um, uh, global public policies. And I want to touch on a few of the uh, important concepts that were developed at that time in terms of climate policies, uh, the ideas of clubs and multilateralism, the idea of a global price of carbon that is still very present if you hear our very well-known French Nobel Prize, uh, Jean Tirole, uh, who's saying that what we need is a global 
carbon price, I completely disagree. I know, no, I don't disagree on the fact that we might need it, but I completely disagree with him in saying that we, that this would be reachable in terms of political negotiation. And he seems quite deaf, not to me because I, he does know me, but uh, he's, he's really not listening to those types of elements. And then coming to, uh, between my second and third point, I will be coming to the event of 2015, where there was the Paris Agreement and the negotiation of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, where again, actually, states were given back uh, the responsibility with the building up of NDC, with the bottom-up approach. Uh, I will come back to the, what, what I mean by bottom-up approach, but you might already have heard about that. Um, then my two, two last points are trying to describe the current period. Uh, first, you see a lot of geopolitical think tanks specialized in security issues now uh, really interested in discussing climate policies because a lot of the, 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 the discussions that we have on decarbonizing our economies is actually now having an effect on the anticipation of where is the power going to lie? What are going to be the resources that are going to be scarce? And so I will take two examples of reports produced by one by uh, IRENA, the International Agency for Renewable Energy, and the other by ECFR, the European Center on Foreign Relations, a very well-known uh, think tank on, on international relations and security at the European scale, uh, and, and, and also with Bruegel, the uh, economic, macroeconomic think tank in Brussels, that discuss how should we think of geopolitics uh, in a world where it's actually not going to be fossil fuel that dictate uh, power and economic, uh, and economic uh, capacity, but it's uh, renewables. Uh, how would that look like? And I think it's important to have that shift in mind. And, and, and maybe you don't see that, but I really want you to look at the question of the geopolitics of climate, not through the only lens of uh, climate change is impacting drought, which leads to refugees coming to Europe, and that's bad. Uh, because that's really a, a securitization narrative that I want to uh, avoid as much as possible. Not to say that this causality event might not happen, but not if, if this is the way that we want to gain political attention on climate by saying, look, if you don't deal with climate, you're going to be uh, so overwhelmed by refugees. This was something actually that there was a report to the Pentagon by the Round Corporation in 98, I think that, that mentioned that to try and raise the attention of the military powers in the uh, US about uh, climate saying, look, if you don't do anything, in the end, lots of refugees and this is a security issue. I think we should really avoid that because actually migration is an adaptation possibility for people. So presenting it as, as a problem is probably not going to be good for the, for the years to come. So I will not talk about <laughs> this securitization scenario. I would rather intend that we look at changes in political issues, new security issues, through the lens of what the transition to decarbonization will produce in terms of security issues. Um, and, and, and so this is basically my third point is at the heart of what I want to, to, to tell you. And it's already 20 minutes that I'm speaking. Uh, the fourth point is about, uh, no, only a quarter of an hour. Uh, the fourth point is really about uh, how to describe the current uh, geopolitical situation. And I'm, I will present a few elements of a conference that we have organized at IDRI. Uh, IDRI celebrated its 20th anniversary this year. And so in October, we gathered a lot of scholars from all over the world on a conference that if you're interested in, you can really look in different replays uh, that was called Next Generation Multilateralism, trying to, sh to look at how sustainability issues might be actually the best way to find solutions to our problems of global governance for the next uh, decade. Inspiration, get, getting inspired by things that have been experimented in global environmental governance or regional environmental governance, but also looking at the fact that the, the environment is a main challenge for uh, global governance in the, in the decade that opens. So that was the menu. And also already, you got all my message. Now we can go and have the discussion. No, I, I need to <laughs> go a little bit into more details. <clears throat> so this is just to get back to uh, some historical examples that I think are important if you want to understand. When, when people talk about global environmental governance, they often have those examples in mind. Uh, and, and so my main message was, uh, even at times of very hard conflict, people are able to negotiate uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the environment. And that's an interesting feature, that uh, common resources is actually uh, of, often seen as the possibility of a war, like between Ethiopia and uh, Egypt sharing the Nile River. Actually, very often, if you look at Israel and Palestine, 
when there was no discussion anymore between the two uh, entities, water was the only issue on, on which they were negotiating. So, so this is also something that is quite important. But here the example is to say that let's not forget that even if the current period seems much more tense geopolitically than what we had thought the period was uh, since, the, since Rio 92, we have the impression that the golden age of uh, the 90s and the, the years 2000, where we, everybody was cooperating, China was getting more development, and we were getting China on board of more global governance. Now we have really the impression that this is tearing apart with, uh, with many other issues like populism, like Brexit, etc. The period is definitely more tensed. That does not mean that we are not going to find innovative and interesting solutions for global, global public goods. So, one example that you might not remember, uh, you probably were not born at that time, uh, around the years, uh, the, the early 80s, there was a big problem in Europe because uh, forests were dying uh, and the, uh, we, we, it was not completely clear at the beginning what was the reason for that. And uh, a lot of, there was a very strong uh, scientific effort to both understand that this was a phenomenon from sulfur oxides in the, in the rains that were, that were killing the trees, and that this, were, that, that was, this was a cycle also, uh, as exemplified here, uh, a cycle that came also from the factories uh, all over Europe that, uh, that, that was transmitted into the atmosphere, but there was a, a transboundary uh, circulation of those uh, chemicals across the borders, and that we needed to cooperate across the Iron Curtain. Of course, the winds in Europe are mostly from west to east, but nevertheless, it was not just the western factories that were killing the, uh, the, the trees in the east. We needed a, a real collaboration between east and west at the moment of, of, of the Cold War. Very importantly, the, the solution, uh, the, 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 the science was extremely uh, instrumental in getting to a political agreement at that time. And I want to mention first of course, the, the very important role of, clam, uh, of meteorologists and climatologists, those, those who look at the atmosphere, who then became well known because they were at the basis of the scientific community that also dealt with uh, the ozone layer and with, the, uh, with, cl with climate change in general. So not exactly the same, but still the same type of... Uh, uh, I mean, climatology was always, um, in, in French academia, for instance, at university, they were the ones who, were, who had the too complicated object to have good publications. And geologists were the smart guys because they had very robust uh, results. That was until the 80s. And suddenly, this community was establishing uh, those who look at the atmosphere, the chemistry of atmosphere, the circulation of atmospheric uh, currents. This was a community that built up its legitimacy also through its capacity to establish political diagnosis that counted, that mattered in terms of political negotiation. An interesting import, uh, important uh, issue also is the fact that uh, you had a very interesting institution that still exists in Vienna called IIASA, IASA. Uh, International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, where scientists of the West and the East were collaborating on modeling the atmosphere, on model, uh, trying to also build up uh, interesting interdisciplinary modeling exercise with economists, sociologists, psychologists, uh, soil scientists, atmospheric chemistry, etc. So, so this was really a place of innovation that we were able to build at the time of Cold War between the East and the West. And in this institution, they built a model of transboundary transfer of those chemicals that led to the problem of acid rains. And so in the end, there was the negotiation of a convention called uh, Long Range Transboundary air, air Pollution at the scale of the uh, United Nations the Economic Commission for Europe, so it was a regional body of the UN that uh, negotiated that, uh, that, uh, that uh, convention. Um, and so first characteristic of that convention, science was instrumental in making the political agreement to some extent, but also the fact that to some extent it was an easy uh, problem to solve compared to biodiversity protection or climate change because basically what you had is a series of factories that were emitting uh, sulfur oxides or nitrous oxides for which you needed to, them to invest in uh, technology substitution or the, an investment in some uh, technology addition to solve the problem. And so you had specifically some people who were going to lose from the solution because they had to invest and that was a cost to them and a specific sector that was going to gain from them 
the forestry sector, for instance. And in that case, this is an easy problem to solve because you know exactly a specific part of each society who will lose, and you can try and compensate them by uh, building a deal. So that was really the model that uh, LRTAP is. If we have the science that shows everything that matters, and the technical solutions to make a deal between those who lose and, and those who gain, we can solve a very complicated problem even between countries that have political, uh, um, completely different, uh, opposed uh, visions. Um, so that's the story that very often people remind, uh, uh, trying to say, ah, oh, but we should use that as a model to solve the climate change problem. Uh, before coming to that, uh, the, um, the there was a kind of a transfer of the same methodology to use science and uh, a technology, techno technological financial deal to solve a problem uh, of cooperation between countries at the global scale. That was then the ozone layer uh, problem. So you know that the, uh, sorry, this, there, there are, I should have re uh, reviewed my, my notes. I don't know if it's tropof tropospheric or stratospheric ozone, but there is a layer of ozone <laughs> quite far away from the, from the surface of the Earth that is protecting us from ultraviolets. Ozone in, in our cities is, is really a poison, but ozone in very high layers of the atmosphere is, a, is, a, is, a, is very important for us not to be burnt by the UVs of the, of, uh, the, the ultraviolets of the, of the sun. Um, and the ozone layer was, was, uh, there was, uh, there was a hole in the ozone layer over the Antarctis, and uh, it was uh, opening up very rapidly. And so again, the same uh, uh, epistemic community, the same scientists uh, or similar scientists of the atmosphere discovered that the problem was a specific gas used in refrigeration technologies where, so normally not, uh, it, was, it was supposed to be closed cycle uh, HFC, uh, hydro, hydrofluorocarbons in our, or CFC, sorry, uh, chlor, uh, carbon, well, I'm not sure, chlorofluorocarbons, so chlorofluorocarbons, CFC, that we use as refrigeration gases in our, in our uh, fridges or other types of refrigeration devices. When, it was, when there was a leak or when it was not uh, dismantled in the proper way, in the atmosphere, this was having a reaction with ozone and then opening up the ozone layer. So the same community of scientists were saying we have identified the problem. It's a global problem because it's the gases emitted everywhere that open up the ozone layer over the Antarctis. And if, it, that, if that grows bigger, it's going to be a, a global public bad, not a global public good, but a global public bad for everybody. So we need to, to cooperate. But again, the problem was quite defined. It was the problem of refrigeration industry. And you had a solution that was to substitute uh, the CFC by another gas that would be uh, not harming the ozone layer. Uh, so what was decided uh, in the years 1987 was the Montreal Protocol to the Vienna Convention of 85 that, that uh, uh, prohibited the use of CFC in the refrigeration industry. And there was a deal, an economic deal between wealthy countries and the industries that had to be compensated to help them invest in another technology, substituting CFC by HFC, HFC being hydrofluorocarbons. What was not known at that time is that hydrofluorocarbons have a very big uh, warming power in terms of climate change. So we substituted a uh, problem for the ozone layer with a problem for climate change, but that was not known at that time. Um, and as I will probably not come back to it, in the, the, in the framework of that convention uh, negotiated in the 80s, there was in, uh, 19, in, uh, two, in 2018 an, another protocol called Protocol of Kigali that pre prohibited the use of HFCs and substituting them by then harmless gases, as much harmless as possible. We don't know what is the other problem that is going to come out of it, but normally they are going to be, the refrigeration gases are going to be much more neutral, much more harm harmless. Uh, so this is just to show you that these models, and pr particularly the transfer, the, 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 tr the transfer of the model of the LRTAP on acid rains the solution, uh, you have a sector, you have a gas, you substitute, you compensate the losers, and then you solve it at international scale. That was transferred to the ozone layer. And a lot of the people who look at the climate change discussion are saying, let's find uh, something a little bit like that. Let's find a solution to climate change that could be of the, same, uh, of the same nature so that we can have a pragmatic solution and not open up a very complicated political discussion between countries. And you saw at COP26, if you followed it, there was a global pledge on methane, uh, CH4, that was to some extent inspired by that. 
methane is a specific gas. Let's find a way for the sectors that are, uh, that are, that are responsible for methane emission that we can compensate their investment in a specific technology. Um, actually, this is more complicated than that because methane is emitted by cows, for instance. When they ruminate, they eructate methane. And so there is no really a technology that can substitute <laughs> ruminants, or at least we, maybe we can just stop eating ruminants, but I'm not sure that this would be exactly a very easy political discussion to have given the role and place of ruminants in the livelihoods of uh, smallholder pastors uh, all over uh, the global south in general, and the role and place of, of uh, ruminant meats in many, many of the cultures of the world. So just to say that uh, this, uh, this model of uh, the ozone layer, the, 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 the acid rains, has been uh, very present in many uh, spaces of the climate negotiation. I think I'm done with that part, really just uh, so I wanted to put on the, on the map the idea that we are able to find a solution even where we are fighting as between the uh, Soviet Union and the US. And that uh, the global environmental governance has been inspired by the very, very, th there is a long lasting shadow of that model where science proposes a solution and you've, you just negotiated a, a deal with a specific sector. My second point in my intervention is to try and have a look. Of course, you see I've, uh, I'm going to get you through history uh, really too rapidly to be very precise. I'm going to cover now 92 to 2015. So of course, that's going to be too complicated in just in a, in a, to, to make it in a uh, to very, uh, I'm going to be too rapid. The, the, the important moment that I want to, to tell, tell, tell you about is, of course, the, uh, uh, the United Nations uh, Conference on Environment and Development, Rio de Janeiro, uh, 1992, uh, that produced a kind of a deal globally uh, that was, um, you probably, you, uh, I mean, you probably know that there was in 72 a first conference on the environment at the UN scale that was in Stockholm where the southern countries were saying, well, environment is a problem of the industrialized nations. Uh, we, from the south, we first need to industrialize and then we'll discuss. In 92, interestingly, southern countries and northern countries were agreeing on the fact that what we needed both for, for now, north and south was a shift in the model of development uh, and that the southern countries could try and leapfrog towards a model of development that would be not necessarily first harming the environment and then trying to reduce the impacts on the environment. Um, so this was also probably made possible, that conference, by the fact that uh, the fall of the Soviet Union had, uh, to some extent, changed the balance of power globally. And China at that time was still a very, uh, very emerging, only emerging economic power, uh, as was India, of course. So the emerging economic powers were not as powerful as they are today. Uh, and so basically, uh, there was that deal between northern and southern countries to say, let's preserve the environment and look for sustainable development in both cases, not with the same pathways, but with the same uh, end point. Um, and what came up of the, uh, out of this uh, discussion are three UN United Nations conventions that are worth noticing. You probably know this one, the UN United Nations Framework, uh, UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. These are the conference of the parties, the COPs that we see every year, normally every year, like COP26 in Glasgow uh, in November. Uh, but the two others you might not know, uh, the CDB, Convention on Biolog uh, CBD in, in, in English, the Convention on, on Biological Diversity, you might know because there is an upcoming very important conference that should have taken place in Kunming, Yunnan, China, uh, normally October last year, then uh, postponed uh, to uh, uh, April, but again postponed last week, so we don't know exactly when it's going to happen. So, and, and it's uh, the, the 15th conference of the parties of uh, the Convention on, on uh, Biological Diversity. And the one that you probably don't know at all is the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Uh, that was also the, that was the third one negotiated uh, in Rio. Um, so what do I want to tell you about that period of, of, of time? And then I come to uh, important moments in that period. Uh, first, I think, as I told you, there was the impression that we could try and build uh, global public policies. So trying to mimic uh, what we have done, for instance, in Europe. In Europe, we've built a nearly federal type of governance uh, where we have a European Commission that develops 
environmental norms and standards, a market policy uh, for the inner market that, that deal with the, uh, uh, the, the competition, the fair level, level playing field, and a cohesion policy that enables to have the investments uh, for those countries or regions in Europe that are uh, at a very low level of development, for them to converge on a, on a better, uh, uh, to have some convergence with the level of development of, uh, of the rest of, of, of the more, more wealthy parts of Europe. So I think that model, that Europe, the European construction was built on uh, an environmental policy, a market policy, and a cohesion policy. To some extent, that inspired people to say, let's build the same things for the world. Because to some extent, we have WTO that is supposed to build a, a, a global market with fair rules for everybody. And you might discuss that, but that was the, the vision that was there in the, in the 1990s about uh, WTO, the World Trade Organization. We would have um, all the efforts of the World Bank, uh, the IMF, and the, uh, the, the development donors from Europe to, to mimic what is the cohesion policy of Europe, the, the, the financing device that helps uh, poor regions or poor countries build uh, infrastructures. And then we would have also the environmental part that would be those conventions that would decide a little bit like what are the norms in terms of uh, environmental protection that we should have globally uh, in order to have also sustainability both on, 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 on economic and environmental uh, issues. So that model is interesting. Uh, but of course, uh, it was a, a vision where we would be, uh, um, not, where we would not have uh, a lot of um, uh, political problems between countries, or where we'd have a lot of agreement to coordinate and build those types of uh, uh, global public policies. And this is not exactly what happened uh, in the period. Um, what happened in the period is that, of course, globalization was extremely uh, efficient in, uh, in, in uh, reducing poverty because it was extremely efficient in helping China reduce poverty in particular, which was, I'm, I'm not just saying that this is uh, not a good result, it's a very good result, but it was not uh, the, 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 the capacity of this uh, uh, regulation framework where WTO would do a job <coughs> Uh, the, the, the financing institu institutions would do, a, would do their job and the environmental uh, standards would do their job. This, nevertheless, led to a situation where a lot of the countries are still very poor and a lot of people within these countries are extremely poor. And uh, we have a lot of environmental uh, damage. So we, we, that, that, that governance framework did not, function, uh, uh, did not function the way it uh, was supposed to function. In particular, there was a lot of problems in, in making those conventions really deliver on uh, protecting the global public goods that we had to, that we had to protect. Um, I think I, I wanted to talk about, um, in that context, three mirages, three illusions that, that people had based on the examples of the, of the decade before that, on the, of, of the 80s. First, there was the, the mirage, the illusion that if science is very good, it's going to convince people, to, I mean politicians, to come to an agreement. As you saw, uh, and I could have other examples, there is a very interesting book by uh, Peter Haas from uh, Massachusetts University on uh, the, 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 the negotiation on protecting the Mediterranean. We have examples in the 80s where when science was able to say we are on a complete consensus on the environmental degradation, then countries are able to actually uh, uh, come to an agreement, a political agreement. So as if science was a political agent able to uh, make the agreement between people who had actually lots of things that are not uh, in diverging interests. In the field of climate, uh, there was a very interesting effort with the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to produce all the science we need to act. But the, that, of course, did not translate at all easily in a solution. The reason that I see there is that um, the, the, the nature of the problem underlying climate change is much more complex than the ozone layer issue. Ozone layer, I told you, there is a sector, refrigeration, there is a technical solution. Actually, the first one was a, was a mismatch because we had a side effect on climate change, but there is another technical solution. So to some extent, that is a simple problem. Um, the, so, so even if science does a lot of uh, uh, good work with the IPCC, 
the nature of the problem is extremely different because when, if we really are serious about climate change, it's not just about technology substitution, but a lot has to do with changing our lifestyles. Uh, if we don't see that the uh, consumption rate that we have in Western countries or in more wealthy parts of the population is actually part of the problem, we will never come to a, to a solution. So that part of the discussion is, of course, extremely dis uh, complicated. I mean, you, you might remember that I think it was George Bush Sr. Uh, after signing this uh, convention, he said that the American lifestyle is not negotiable. Uh, and that's just one element about the things that are not going, that, 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 was, uh, that is at the heart of the problem. I think it's Prime Minister Modi from India who's put the issue of uh, lifestyles on the table. And of course, there are a lot of uh, political backgrounds to that statement, uh, getting back to a, a traditional Hinduist uh, vision of uh, what a good lifestyle is, frugality, etc. So I'm not sure that I completely buy everything that he, because there is a lot of political intention behind that. But it's interesting to see that this is coming back into the discussion uh, at COP26. So what I wanted to tell you is that uh, the, the solutions of the, of the 80s were not very problematic in terms of economic choices. When we come to climate change or to biodiversity, if we're serious about them, it's about a complete change in the business models of many sectors. We can't do that without having a complete... Uh, we need to transform the sectors in a way that is radical. We need to think of business models where we, the idea is not just to substitute technologies, but to sell less of something while trying to make more money. Uh, so these issues of changing completely the mindset uh, is really central, and that cannot be solved by those types of pragmatic solutions to a complicated negotiation problem where you try to find uh, a technical solution and who bears the cost of it and then compensate those who um, have to make that, those investments. Um, but in the meantime, uh, you had uh, uh, many people trying to say, for instance, Scott Barrett, who is a scholar at Columbia University, he was discussing with Laurence Tubiana, so I should have said that the institute where I work was founded by Laurence Tubiana, who had been the ambassador for climate for France at COP21, who was the architect to some extent of the Paris Agreement. And so she was my director for uh, head of COP21. And she was having that discussion with American scholars who were saying why, they were asking Laurence Tubiana, why do you aim at a universal agreement where every country would subscribe to decarbonization, etc., etc., while there is no solution to that. Scott Barrett is a specialist of uh, experimental economics in uh, game theory, and he's having his uh, students play, showing that there is no solution to the climate problem uh, if you take it as a whole. And he was advocating for sectoral uh, club uh, negotiation, saying, let's find the equivalent of the ozone layer discussion and let's solve one by one some of the issues. Let's take, for instance, the HFCs from ret refrigeration and let's find a way to substitute technology in refrigeration. That was done with the Kigali protocol. Let's look at uh, uh, methane. So he was trying to advocate to uh, slice down, slice in pieces the, the, the climate problem to find pragmatic, successively uh, um, clubs of, uh, of solutions uh, to the problem. And this is what uh, Pascal Lamy, the former um, director general of WTO, who is quite involved now in trying to uh, solve these issues at global scale, he's calling that polylateralism. So not just multilateral solution, but small numbers of, 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 of players uh, finding a solution. Um, and the, 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 the issue, there are two issues why Laurence Tubiana was resisting those elements. The first one I already told you, um, if you slice the problem into specific gases with specific technological solution, you probably, in the end, will have to face the problem that it's about the lifestyles, about the consumption society in general that needs to be addressed directly, or you will only marginally address uh, the, the problem of climate change because the magnitude of what we need to do is, is, is really important. The second problem that she wanted to put on the table is that there is a a very problematic uh, discussion on fairness and justice. If you slice the problem into saying, I'll have a deal with, uh, for instance, the Kigali agreement was basically a discussion with India uh, because India is the place where air conditioning is going to have to explode. 
uh, because of the impacts of climate change that are already here and because of the fact that there are lots of people who are going to afford uh, acquiring uh, air conditioning in the next uh, uh, decade. So a lot of the attention was, can we have a deal to see how we can have um, enough uh, economic compensation or cheap enough technology in, in air conditioning that would be not using the technologies of the past that, that are bad for, for, for climate change, that are more energy efficient, that don't uh, harm climate change, not using HFCs. And can we have uh, those people in India who will ha have air conditioning access that at an affordable price? And that was a very specific discussion focusing on one specific geographical context. And many southern countries, in the, in the, in the, when they look at those types of agreements, they say, if we don't bring those agreements back into the UN sphere, it's going to be very unfair negotiation where the West, who has the, wealth, the, the, the power of the wealth and the power in the UN institution, will again dictate the agenda and dictate the solutions to southern countries. We have a reminder of that in the COP26 discussion because that idea of clubs is still very present now that we have the Paris Agreement as, a, as an overarching uh, framework within which countries can discuss. You might have heard at uh, COP26 that there was an agreement uh, no, you might not have heard of it because it, it's quite technical. What I, what I think you might have heard from COP26 is that there were so many things that were announced that none in the end was really credible. I mean, Greta Thunberg said blah, blah, blah. Uh, and she's right. I mean, too, when you have too many big announcements like 100, uh, 130 trillions are aligned, uh, that was Mark, Mark Carney, the, the financial ex-governor of the Bank of England, 130 trillion dollars are now aligned with climate change objectives, etc. And so that's, that was, that's not credible, uh, and that was not true, or needed a little bit of a specification. So too many things were announced. But one thing that was extremely interesting, and that many people tried to replicate, is a specific agreement that was uh, done between, on one side, South Africa, on the other side, uh, UK, US, France, Germany, and the European Union. And the point in the middle was the uh, electricity company of the South Africa, ESCOM, that is in a very bad financial situation because there was lots of issues of mismanagement in ESCOM, lots of political issues also about this mismanagement. But in the end, it was, uh, there was a need for more uh, finance being pumped in. And at the same time, there had been uh, an agreement within South Africa to try and uh, discuss what would be the policy to get ESCOM out of coal so that ESCOM, the electricity company of South Africa, does not use coal for its production, but at the same time that there is a requalification policy for workers in coal in order to get South Africa out of coal in general. So that agreement is actually, I think, both interesting, efficient, and fair, uh, because there, the, the, it was really South Africa deciding on their policy, on what they wanted, and then uh, uh, northern countries coming with the money to make the deal uh, a possibility, and really triggering decarbonization, I mean, getting, phasing out, uh, phasing out coal from South Africa, to, uh, in, in the longer run, but with a, a, really triggering that type of transition. Uh, so that is extremely interesting as, a, as, an, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example, but I've seen many African colleagues saying, if this is the model that you want to impose on you, on us, uh, we will feel really disadvantaged because in general, if you, you are a weak uh, electricity company because we have debts, etc., and suddenly you come with the money, you are going to dictate the conditions. So how can we ensure that this is fair enough? And this is why one of the reasons why Laurence Tubiana had always been arguing with the American colleagues at Columbia that we needed the Paris Agreement. Is she said we need to have a conversation where all countries discuss their decarbonization pathways universally, and we don't look sight, we don't look, uh, we don't lose sight of the needs and specific, uh, specific issues of southern countries and typically the question of adaptation um, that was really badly managed at, uh, at COP26 are the, the, the issues that the southern countries are putting on the equation. So I think I tried not to lose you but this issue of trying to have clubs and polylateral arrangements is still very present in the current discussion but uh, it's, there is a strong challenge of how to make those clubs then being sure that they are being discussed, over, overseen in a universal scale in multilateral institutions at the UN scale. Uh, just a word about the global price for carbon. Um, of course, and I'm, I'm not an economist. I've studied economics, but I'm not an economist. I must, I must say, and you are. Uh, and 
So I'm, I must be cautious. What I think economics does very well is to define a solution that is both efficient and fair. Generally, that's the issue of economics, to have an allocation that makes it both efficient and fair. So of course, Jean Tirole is right to say, uh, we will not, uh, if, we had, if we had a global price of carbon, we would have the solution that would be both efficient, making the efforts where they are the, 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 the cheapest, and fair, because there would be a way to allocate that uh, to, 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 make it, to make it fair. The only thing that, that is really problematic and that, that did not function uh, is that if you want to make that happen, you need to decide on the uh, allocation of rights before, uh, for instance. I'm, I'm here I'm a little bit beyond my expertise, but what I understood of an ETS, an emission trading scheme, is that you need to have a first allocation. Having the first allocation between, uh, of rights uh, in the market between India, Europe and China is exactly the, the type of zero-sum game that, that countries are not accepting because it's about transferring a lot of money virtual money, but a lot of money by allocating just the, the emissions right. That's my, at least my analysis, that to, to, to put in simple words why the political solution is really not possible. That's why uh, Laurence Tubiana said, because, and, and, and maybe there was a kind of a hubris, if, you, if I, I pronounce it well in English, of the environmental economists in the years of the Kyoto Agreement, uh, Kyoto Protocol in 97, a lot of the uh, very good people in environmental economics thought that this was the moment where um, uh, environmental economics would, would translate into policy, like in reality, uh, directly. So the, the Kyoto Protocol, the ETS system, the emission trading scheme in Europe. So they thought that this would be just very easily translating. Uh, but there was a lot of political, um, uh, how you say, that? inertia, political viscosity of uh, the decision system that made it much more complicated than that. And to some extent, this idea that the global carbon price is the ideal is still quite important because that's also a way to think of what it would look like if we could negotiate that. But the political uh, power, the, 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 the political problems of what it means to negotiate when you have no government that could establish that is just explaining that this will not happen. And Laurence Tubiana, just to talk about, uh, again about her personality to make it a little bit more concrete, she's an economist, but she said, uh, she really said we are not going to solve that through uh, trying to uh, negotiate a global carbon price. We need to rather look at a, pro a process uh, discussion. This is where she tried to say we need to make it bottom up that every country in the world shows that they have their own interest in decarbonizing the economy um, and that uh, they could uh, then discuss how uh, they could, years after years, um, go to uh, collectively decide uh, that they can uh, look collectively at uh, the, accumulation, the accumulated efforts uh, in terms of decarbonization that they can do and then come back to their countries and say, what do I need if I want to be more ambitious? And that's the ratcheting mechanism of the Paris Agreement, where every five years, normally, countries are supposed to increase their ambition in terms of mitigation. That was what was discussed at, at COP26. Uh, so I've just put here in the picture COP15 in Copenhagen 2009, that was really the failure of, uh, of, of negotiation, trying to have a negotiation where we uh, to some extent, the idea was that we, have a, we had a, 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 a carbon budget globally and we needed to share it. So who's, 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 uh, who has the right to continue emitting uh, in the next decade? And there is in, in the uh, Rio uh, principles, there is the, the principle of common but differentiated responsibility that says that, of course, those countries who have had an industrial revolution based on carbon uh, since the 19th century have already eaten up nearly the whole of their carbon budget, if you look at it in terms of uh, uh, allocation of carbon budget per person or, or per GDP, and that the rest of the emissions would be actually normally for southern countries. But that is not, again, that type of uh, zero-sum game negotiation does not happen, because those who have the power don't want to just surrender uh, for, for, for the, 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 the fact that they will certainly do all the efforts while others would not do. And so I'm not saying that this is morally acceptable, it's just not politically negotiable. Um, and that was the failure of Copenhagen, to put it that way. Uh, in between, you had the 20, 20th anniversary of uh, Rio, and um, Rio plus 20 uh, in 2012 uh, was an interesting conference 
because it was a conference where uh, the European Union and the United Nations Environment Program came with the idea that um, we would all be looking for uh, the green economy. So they had the concept of the green economy being uh, what is going to be the future. And that was not at all accepted by uh, southern countries. They just said, this is again Europe coming with the idea that uh, they have a concept that will then come back to us in terms of trade barriers. So I hope you understand that this resonates a lot with the current situation. But again, ahead of 2012, there was this notion that Europe was trying to say, well, let's agree that we all seek for uh, the green economy. And so southern countries said, this I would not accept. Uh, the UNDP, the, 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 the head of the UN, uh, United Nations Environment Program was Achim Steiner, a German guy, who is now the head of UNDP, UN United Nations Development Program. And so there was the vision that UNEP was actually uh, driven by, by uh, European interests also. So what happened in, in uh, Rio, and that was also useful to deliver uh, the COP21 uh, 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 results, is, is so 2012 here, was that Colombia and Guatemala uh, said, well, actually, let's define uh, 17, uh, let's define a set of goals. They did not say 17, a set of goals that we would also subscribe to and then say that what we need is to define our specific pathway to reaching those goals. Uh, and, and really, and they were anchoring, uh, instead of having a green uh, economy uh, definition coming from Europe, they said, let's define, let's see if we can define a kind of a political project for the world, including issues about gender, about inequalities that Piketty had just begun to put on the, on the global uh, uh, public debate. Uh, so not really uh, that dif disseminated at that time. And so that was very interesting because it was southern countries who were proposing that new framework. And at IDRI, we defend a lot the political significance of the Sustainable Development Goals. They have very little traction in Europe in terms of changing anything. But politically, globally, they matter a lot because they were proposed by two southern countries as the new way to define what is the political project for the world. Actually, to some extent, that would be the project for global public policies if we had a government to implement them. But we don't have a government to make them, to make them a reality. But that conversation was extremely useful for Laurence Tubiana and Laurent Fabius to try and establish uh, the, the bottom-up perspective for climate change at COP, uh, at COP21. So I'm going to speak for more than, than one hour if I want to finish. Is that a problem? I, 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 I keep... Uh, do, we, do we have to finish at uh, sharp 6.30? No, no. Uh, I mean, you can talk for 15 or 20 more minutes and then we'll have the discussion. No, no. Okay, but, but do we have to finish sharp at uh, 6.30 or...? At 6.30, yes. Okay. So important, uh, impor important uh, to, to know. So uh, I, th I think what I wanted to tell you here uh, yeah, is basically that this, was, this is where we ended up having uh, the idea that the only solution is a procedural solution, bottom up, where every country says, we all agree that in the end, we want to protect biodiversity, we want to have uh, stopped climate change, we want to have reduced inequalities, etc., etc. Um, but every country will define their own pathway of transformation to get there, depending on their history, on their specific geographical circumstances, their level of development, etc., etc. And, 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 and then the idea is that by cross-comparing, you could establish a kind of a learning process, you could also establish uh, corporations that would accelerate the transformation of the different countries. I, I conceptually, I love the concept and I really defend it always because I think if you look at that, then you could also discuss, for instance, between Indonesia and Europe, instead of discussing should we stop uh, importing palm oil from Indonesia uh, in Europe because it's bad for orang outang, uh, we might just look also at the fact that what we need to discuss between Europe and Indonesia is what are our transformation pathways to sustainability and then how can trade between us accelerate the capacity to, to get there rather than discussing already now how to, uh, uh, that, we, that we stop importing palm oil for instance. And sometimes if we stop importing the palm oil from Malaysia or, or uh, Indonesia, we actually substitute it 
in the current model with rapeseed oil that is full of pesticides production in Europe that is environmentally not necessarily uh, the best one. So you might actually do counterintuitive things if you don't get into that framework where what you try to discuss is how, uh, what is the path to a transformation that we need to, that we need to have. But the, where we ended up is that these two frameworks, the bottom-up approach of COP21 and the SDGs, Agenda 2030, have reinstated a lot the responsibility of national governments. They are the ones in intergovernmental settings who are deciding what is the, 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 their policy in terms of climate objectives, what is their policy in terms of SDGs. Uh, and they are really putting, a, we put a lot of emphasis on uh, national state-driven uh, policies and, and government policies. At the same time when a lot of the scholars are saying that actually uh, transnational companies are much more powerful than individual nation states. So why do we put so much emphasis on, on nation states? I would say that this is just the only way forward that we were able to design in the state of play of, of, uh, of, the, of the period in which we are. But it's true that um, we need to also find a way to um, not only think that governments on their own could find uh, solutions to our, to our problems. If you think back of what I've been, the example of the deal with ESCOM in, um, in South Africa, this is probably already this notion that nation states and government, national governments on their own cannot be uh, finding all the solutions is probably already uh, embedded, uh, is already integrated in that type of deal where it's a private company, probably publicly owned, but uh, a company, uh, um, uh, uh, some, some uh, the, the trade unions were associated to the deal. So it's not just governments, governments. It's a much more complex type of arrangement that was there. And I think that's quite illustrative of the type of things that we need to, to look for. So now, um, two elements of, this, uh, of these uh, reports. Uh, so so th th at that time, 2015, the world looked really beautiful. We were ahead of Trump's election. We were ahead of the Brexit referendum. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking about my own political, <laughs> my own political uh, norms. So I'm sorry if, uh, if that might, uh, I, I should prevent to do that. But to some extent, the, the world seemed easy to manage uh, because there was a lot of alignment about the fact that global cooperation is better than no cooperation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And just the year after that, uh, the Brits decided to get out of Europe, uh, Trump was elected and decided to step out of the Paris Agreement. So the whole architecture here was really um, uh, interfered very heavily by the notion that uh, uh, geopolitics mattered and that uh, polit internal politics could lead uh, to, to a, a global um, um, community that was very divided with unilateral uh, decisions to just not play by the rules, for instance. Uh, and it's not just uh, Trump, it's also Duterte in the Philippines. So lots of the, uh, and Bolsonaro in Brazil for, for to some extent also. So lots of them, uh, lots of the countries are really just openly, uh, not necessarily playing by the rules. While before that, we thought that at least the rules-based order was something that was extremely important. You might just discuss that when the president of France decided to uh, uh, make war to Gaddafi in Libya. That was not really rules-based order, and I would agree with you that even France can be a rogue player. So I'm not saying that everything is uh, always Filipinas or Brazil, huh? but just saying that uh, in general, there was more or less uh, an understanding that we would play by the rules. Um, so that made also very, lots of people think, well, we need to think again a little bit more, in, uh, not, too, not too much about the fact that we are progressing towards better cooperation, but that there are going to be uh, political powers in the world to come. And in particular, uh, there are going to be lots of challenges, not just because of climate change and its impact, but also of the transition that we want to happen. And so these are the two reports uh, that I wanted to, uh, to, to present to you briefly, to just uh, uh, present to you interesting messages coming from those uh, reports, but also having a kind of an ana a critical analysis of what, my, what is still lacking in the way that those geopolitical thinking look at the, um, uh, look at the situation. Um, so yes, what, what, what I think is really important is that um, at the same time as uh, environment uh, 
begins, begins to become really center stage, meaning that uh, uh, China declares that uh, modern, modernization of China means green and digital. So green, green transformation is just now something or carbon neutrality is at the heart of uh, economic strategies of major innovative powers like uh, South Korea, China, Japan, uh, Europe, US, etc. So green transformation has become really mainstream in terms of uh, economic uh, project, economic transformation project for the world. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, discussion about uh, power, rivalry between powers and, uh, and security that is actually, actually extremely, extremely central. Um, let me just look at what I wanted to tell you there before coming to the two reports. Yes, I think what, what the first report tries to do is to say that if we are serious about uh, the transformation to uh, carbon neutrality, the role of renewables, we are actually going to experience a transition as important as the eruption of fossil fuel in the, uh, in the, uh, with the Industrial Revolution with, carbon, with uh, coal and with petroleum, uh, with oil in the, uh, in the 20th century. So the change in where the power lies, in the change in where conflicts are happening in the world because there, is, there are scarce resources that are uh, une unequally distributed over the world, we need to think already uh, that the world of, a, a world of renewables, that's the, uh, the, the geopolitics of the energy transformation is the name of the report by the International, energy, International Renewable Energy Agency, uh, that we need to, to think of what, what would be the, the, the new conflicts of a world of renewables. And just a few messages from that, because I think it's quite interesting. Uh, the first thing that they say um, is that first, the, the production of energy is going to be more distributed. So instead of having just uh, specific areas like uh, the Middle East, China, no, the Middle East, the US and Venezuela, uh, to name at least a few, where oil and fossil fuel production is concentrated, the production of, a, of a renewable energy might be much more distributed. So that changes quite a lot, uh, the way that security might be less problematic or at least less, less uh, able to be, uh, to, to, th that we would probably have different ways to look at uh, the, uh, the uh, appropriation, the ownership over the resources. The only thing is that even if the production itself might be distributed, uh, there are specific scarce resources at play in the renewable energies, uh, the, the specific metals uh, that you have in batteries or in uh, windmills, etc. And so um, the, the idea would be to look at how, instead of having wars or security issues in the Middle East, they would spread to places where we have those uh, specific resources, raw material resources. And in particular, they come from China, or from DRC, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, other places also, but they are also very concentrated. So this is really also about how we think of uh, dependency on those regions, or also how these regions, because very often it's not because you have the resources that you have the power. If you look at DRC, that's the malediction of having a very wealthy resource ground. It's generally where power tries to intervene. Uh, and sometimes, I mean, you could say the same from Saudi Arabia. A lot of uh, the Brits and the, and the Americans were really very important in the, in the 1920s to, to influence and, and get, uh, get, the, get at grips on what was happening in that part of the world. Um, and, and that, I think, is extremely important to think of maybe there is going to be a shift in the way Territories matter for their resources. Um, and and um, I think also that this raises not just the issue about power and conflict, but also about, uh, particularly for Africa, uh, how this new economy is not going to put them back again to being only the ones providing, uh, the countries providing raw materials without any added value being captured on their territory. I hear that a lot from African colleagues now. Uh, when when, from, when uh, Europe is going to discuss the Green Deal of Europe with Africa at the Europe-Africa summit in foreseen in February this uh, next year under the French presidency of the European Union, um, the Africans are saying, but if we are trying for, for decades to industrialize, to be able to have jobs in, a, in a, an industry sector and not just in a primary extractive sector, to gain more added value processing at home, 
if your green deal is again to just take the resources, the raw materials for, for, the, for the renewables from us and processing them in Europe or in China, this is not going to be a win-win solution for us. So this is also a way to look at how is that going to, uh, to, to change the pathway of development of the different, uh, of the different countries. Um, and then the other thing that is also extremely important in that uh, report is to say, uh, of course, um, it's not the same to have the oil concentrated in the Middle East and these uh, uh, specific metals uh, in, in China, because actually those metals, you don't uh, consume them. You could, if, you, if we were actually very good at, in Europe, for instance, at recycling at circular economy, we would not build in a dependency on China. We could just, uh, at the moment, recycle without consuming those elements that are key in our batteries, in our cell phones, etc., etc. This is still not in place, this circular economy, and we waste a lot of it. But to some extent, it's not con the, these uh, raw materials are not consumed, so it would probably not ex install the same type of dependency and, and, and security issues as the, as the oil thing. And the last and, uh, element from this report that I find quite interesting is to say um, the, um, because it's going to be extremely decentralized, the production of, of, of electricity, of renewable energy, a lot of the discussion is going to be about interconnectivity of networks. Uh, and that leads to the fact that security would be a lot about network security and data, uh, because a lot of the way that we manage networks is about data and, and digital. So this is not completely uh, surprising, but that puts a lot of emphasis on the fact that if we want, for instance, if Europe wants to secure uh, its future in terms of the, in the world of renewables, the capacity to uh, have sovereignty over data, over software, over digital is extremely important. Uh, and cannot, you cannot just say, I'm, I've secured my sourcing of raw materials. The data part is going to be extremely, extremely important. Um, the other report is the one that you have here by ECFR, the European Council on Foreign Relations, and Bruegel, two think tanks, uh, European based think tanks, and they try to say what, what, if we implement really the Green Deal, that is this transformation project of the whole of Europe towards being carbon neutral and uh, protecting biodiversity, how would that change our relations, security relations with the rest of the world? So of course there is the issue that we would be more independent from Russia and Algeria in terms of gas, for instance, but the report is discussing quite a lot to what extent this is going to be problematic. Uh, there, if we just explain to Russia that uh, in 10 years from now we, we, we don't need the gas anymore, how is uh, Russia going to... Uh, Russia is already anticipating that. And so what is, what is, how can we explain also the complicated relationship we have, we have with Russia with that, uh, with that specific issue? Um, and of course, to some extent, a world of renewables would be very interesting for Europe because that would secure much, e much more easily energy security for, for Europe. Um, another thing that they put in the report is to say that um, that in, in a world where the technology is going to change quite rapidly, the capacity to be the standard setters, the one who, who sets the standards and the norms, is going to be a very important source of power. That is the whole literature on uh, soft power that emerged uh, already in the 90s about the fact that having one of the biggest markets uh, globally, if uh, Europe sets a norm, then it also sets the norms not just for its own market, but for the whole world. And I think that this is an element of geopolitics that is also extremely, extremely important. Um, the last thing that they say here that is extremely important also is the fact that um, if we want to make the Green Deal, there are going to be uh, lots of renegotiation about our trade relationships with the rest of the world. And, and, and I think here again, it's useful. At the beginning, I didn't like that report because it was really looking at the question of the Green Deal only through the lens of energy security, as if the only counterparts with whom we needed to negotiate were Russia and Algeria. But actually, when we discuss the Green Deal, the whole of Africa matters, as I said, or the Indonesia and Malaysia, who are already really 
very worried about the deforestation regulation that I mean the fight against imported deforestation regulation that we have in Europe because that would have an impact on their uh, opportunities for, for, for development and so what I think we need to really be very cautious at is that if we want to make that transformation the trade relations and the, the, the supply chains that we are going to build. I took the example of the, the supply chains of the, the, the raw materials for building up um, um, or batteries, for instance, and in the way that we could try and build up something that uh, captures added value in DRC and not just exporting raw materials, but many other supply chain will matter in the way that we will design the relationship between the European, uh, uh, the European market and the rest of the world. So you remember I told you 10 years ago, there was a real uh, uh, refusal by the rest of the world to say green economy, this is a European context, uh, con concept. We don't want that to be uh, a barrier to our capacity to export to Europe. So we will not go into that negotiation. 10 years after Rio plus 20, the atmosphere has changed drastically because actually green economy is just happening, uh, not enough. But to some extent, what I was trying to tell you is that the, 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 the importance of the investment in, in renewables in China, uh, everywhere in the world, is just making that part of the economy a reality. It's not green enough to me, but it's very green compared to what was accepted 10 years ago. Uh, and so to some extent, uh, the claim by southern countries, uh, southern countries is still very important. How can we make the trade relations uh, that Europe has with the rest of the world not a matter of conflict, but a matter of capacity for our counterparts to transform to sustainability, as we are also trying to transform to sustainability. Um, so I have three minutes for my last slide, and I need to, be, um, to, to select what I wanted to tell you here. Um, Maybe the, the main point that I wanted to, uh, to, to allude to uh, is really, yes, to, to, to say that I've, I've already told you some elements that are interesting in terms of uh, COP26. You probably noticed also at, at COP26 that there was uh, uh, not just the text of the Glasgow Agreement, but a lot of the pledges that I mentioned. And on top of that, uh, this uh, US-China uh, agreement. At the same time as US and China are just telling everywhere that they are conflicting, they are able to, uh, to sign an agreement saying we are going to work jointly on climate. So the, here again, you might say this is, if they do that, it's because their, their, their pledges on climate is actually insincere, that it doesn't matter. I don't believe that. I think that we are in a very interesting moment where, um, again, the environment is the only thing on which we can uh, negotiate, cooperate. Of course, it's going to be competitive, but it's not the same to be both cooperating and, comp and, and, and in competition. That's okay. It's not the same to be conflicting. And I think on the environment, what, what has been installed with the race to zero, to zero emissions that was uh, very present at COP26 is really something where we could find an area where we are both in this uh, Cooperative, uh, both cooperation and competition uh, relation that, that, that is, uh, I think, quite, uh, quite interesting. I've told you about the fact that in COP26, we had had these polylateral agreements. So a reminder of the club uh, discussions that I mentioned uh, historically already dating back to the uh, acid rain discussions. But this might be an interesting model. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to say is that um, one thing that was very obvious at COP26 was the anger of southern countries uh, because they have always the impression that the agenda is driven by northern countries and that their claim for finance, their claim for adaptation, was always considered to be secondary, uh, while the northern countries were only focusing on ambition in terms of uh, climate change mitigation, reduction in, in emissions uh, of greenhouse gases. And that is really, interestingly, I, generally China and the rest of the southern countries are well aligned under what is called the group G77 plus China. And China, to some extent, hides very often behind the poorest countries, saying we can't accept the northern solution. I saw in Glasgow a lot of the, uh, uh, the other southern countries. Indonesia, who is going to have the presidency of the G20 next year. India, who is going to have the G20 presidency the year after that. Uh, African countries saying uh, we can't stand anymore the empty promises of northern countries. We have a lot of, there is a lot of asymmetry in the world of today 
because access to vaccines is unequal and uh, the capacity to recover from the crisis is linked to being able to access to vaccines. And uh, the promises in terms of financing development are not there, and you're still not able to uh, uh, agree on the, using the special drawing rights uh, of the IMF to reallocate them for us, while you have lots of public money uh, pouring, uh, raining on your economies in Europe, in the US, and in China. Um, and, Ch and India, in that case, is really saying, we are not China. Our capacity to access financial markets is very limited. So there is a differentiation that I think, not to say that I want to divide China and India for the West to be able to win over the power. That's not my point. I'm just saying, and this is why I'm just referring to something that might seem very old, the non-aligned movement uh, just before the oil crisis of 73. There was a publication of, uh, here you find a, a, a mark, for, how you say that, um, a seal uh, post for, for, from, uh, I think, uh, the 70s, that is uh, talking about the Nouvel Ordre Economique International, the new international economic order that was actually a proposal by the non-aligned movement ahead of the uh, oil crisis in 73, where they, where they were saying, if we at some point do not deal with the root causes of structural asymmetry in the economic uh, system today, we are never going to be able to develop. Uh, and, and there is something definitely flawed in that. What came out of this uh, discussion was then that at some point there was the oil crisis and it was a small club of countries, the OPEC countries, that were able to uh, use the energy crisis to, to gain more power and gain more development capacity. So I'm, I'm making a kind of a, a little bit audacious analogy with that moment, just to say that I heard in, in, uh, in, um, in Glasgow a lot of a kind of a new, new, new non-aligned movement of southern countries saying, we know that we are going to progressively gain more economic importance for you. The Africa is a market uh, that is going to matter in the years to come. If you want, if, even if you don't want it, you meaning uh, the US or, or Europe, we are going to be important and we are going to ask for more power in decisions, in global governance, in uh, also the structure of the supply chains. And this was to me, I think we are in a moment that is geopolitically, geop geopolitically quite important and that the Western countries are not, are not getting. And the last point, I'm not too late, <laughs> not too, uh, and the really last point is just to say that, interestingly, the recent, there is also, uh, so, so what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that it's not new for southern countries to say the structure of the economic system is unfair. And as, as long as it's not rebalanced, it's going to stay unfair forever because the engine is unfair. And, and so that's not new. And I'm, you could tell me, but, well, uh, you don't, but what's, what's, what, what's the perspective? What is going to change that? I think that the capacity or the possibility of a reallocation of power within the economic system is, uh, is probably going to be a, a discussion that will matter in the future. I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but that might be a, an interesting scenario to discuss. Particularly because when you are Nigeria, you know that, you are, uh, that it's a very complicated country to manage, but you know that you are you have an economic power that will matter and that you can't just be disregarded by the rest of the world. And so I think that, interestingly, that discussion of those saying, this is too unfair, we need to change it, the victims of the systems are gaining power to some extent, not just moral power, but strategic power. And I would say the same for uh, the fact that actually a lot of the discussion is not so much about national security, but something that uh, Bertrand Badi calls more global security, where we need to look also at the power of other types of players. If you remember, there was a, Congress, a World Congress on Nature in Marseille uh, in September. That was uh, IUCN, so a big, big, uh, big event, but of course uh, also virtual, that really insisted on uh, the importance of uh, indigenous people uh, as being the ones who preserve biodiversity, uh, a, a very important part of biodiversity. And this is also not new to say that uh, indigenous people matter, but as they have no power and no economic importance, they are just disappearing very rapidly. Uh, and so I think it's interesting to see that uh, there are more and more people convinced politically that if we don't uh, reallocate power to these very weak parts of the, of the global 
society, we are not going to be able to, to, to deal with the, uh, with, the, um, with the economic crisis. So I'm not going to be able to convince Jair Bolsonaro that he should protect, give more rights to indigenous people in Brazil. But there is a, a global understanding that these people, the very people, matter. And it's not just for moral issues that we need to, to give them more power. It's also because they are instrumental in finding the solutions. So, and this could be also what you hear in the, uh, there was a, an agreement in Escasu in, in, uh, for Latin America that is also giving more rights to indigenous people. So there is something here. I think quite interesting is probably because I'm optimistic and it's Friday night. Um, I believe that there is something where uh, we might be surprised by the way that those who are, whom we have always considered the weakest in, an, in a very unequal uh, economic system globally, might gain power or might gain the possibility to change uh, the system. Um, and I try to advise uh, the fact that if Europe wants to be to find a, a way out of the rivalry between China and and, uh, and the U.S., probably it would be good for Europe to try to really re -found, re uh, find a new way to partner with African countries and with the this global South. Not at all the way they are negotiating now, because this is the only way for Europe to try and, and, and make it strategically more, and more important for them. So I'm not a geopolitician because I'm too optimistic and a little bit naive, a utopian. But really, the thing that I see here is really that utopia is meeting real politics at some point. There is a part of the utopian things of the new non-aligned movement that might become real politics real politic in, the, in, the, in the years to come. That was my long story, long speech. Thank you for, I see that you, not everybody, uh, I mean, a lot of you are not asleep <laughs> while it's very late. You have your mask and it's a complicated situation. Thanks for listening.